that was one. Uh, Josh, I guess we go live stream. I guess the live stream might hear this. I talked about the, the early years of my DVD. One guy took me during the summer. <laughs> and uh, so he had, a, he had this uh, uh, video player in his, uh, in his van with his kids. About halfway through the vacation, his wife said, can't we just turn Dr. Essex off? <laughs> and I said, you know, my family said that a lot too. All right. <laughs> All right, let's look uh, very quickly at the historical background, which I've already brought up from uh, Daniel, is the Persian Empire. And uh, with Ezra and Nehemiah, we are looking at the uh, first uh, five kings of uh, the Persian Empire, though uh, Cambyses, uh, the son of Cyrus, is not mentioned in Ezra Nehemiah, is not mentioned, to my knowledge, in any biblical text. Now, you can get some old commentaries that think uh, uh, some of the names in Ezra chapter 4 that we'll look at uh, tomorrow are code names for Cambyses, but there's really no historical evidence that that, uh, that is true. Yeah. I can't see your computer. Is it showing on the screen behind you? No, it's not. What happened? Uh, oh, did we turn? I, I'm sorry. In turning this light off of Elmo, all right. Sorry about that. This should bring us back, right? Turning the Elmo back on. Yeah, you may have to hit the quit button so it shows the computer. You've got it. Uh, is it coming up here? Well, you have the notes in front of you anyway. Right? Well, the, well, the projector may have shut off and didn't have input after five minutes. Maybe I should have to turn it back on a little more. Oh, all these just technological issues. It should be in the drawer. This reminds me of. I guess I got to remember all these things. Is it on now? There it goes. All right. Okay. I don't know whether these are good memories or bad memories. Of, uh, remember, there it goes. All right. Well, you got your notes in front of you while that that is coming up. Okay. So there are the uh, the five. Uh, Kings, as you can see, all having uh, uh, somewhat extensive uh, reigns. It begins with Cyrus, and significantly, we know a lot about Cyrus before we get to Ezra, just based upon previous uh, biblical material. Cyrus is first introduced to us anonymously in Isaiah 41. It talks about one who will come from the east and will conquer kingdoms, as a prelude to uh, uh, being Israel's uh, savior, allowing them to be delivered from Babylon. It is, it is significant on, in light of Isaiah chapter 41 that uh, Cyrus in his decree in verse 1, I'm sorry, in chapter 1 verse 2, says that the Lord, that is Yahweh, the God of heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And that, that would be reflective of what is in Isaiah 41 for the purpose, Isaiah 44, 24 to 45, 7. I wish we had time to read these passages. You're going to have to read them on your own. Where God says, you know, Okay, he's going to be the, uh, the redeemer of Israel is going to work through one who is going to, who is going to be, you know, my anointed one who will speak to allow Israel to go back and rebuild the temple. And so that you might know that I know the end from the beginning. I even say his name. His name is Cyrus. Of course, so it's the Lord who gives Cyrus the kingdoms of the earth, including Babylon, so that he might be the one that issues the decree for Israel to go back and rebuild the temple. That's, that is Isaiah. Now, significantly, Ezra makes no comment about Isaiah. That in Ezra 1.1, 1, 1, 
The Lord is fulfilling his word, but his word by the mouth of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah also speaks of Cyrus. He speaks about the Medes in Jeremiah 51 that will be the Lord's instruments to defeat Babylon. And in fact, in verse 1 again, in verse 11, he talks about the fact that, that the Lord is the one who's going to stir up the Medes. And significantly the same verb that is used in Ezra 1. So I think that Ezra 1 is referring back to Jeremiah 51. And again, uh, speaking about Cyrus and Cyrus' victory over the Babylonians. Question comes, how did Cyrus know all of this? Do his words that, uh, you know, the Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. How do he know that? Who might have written the, uh, the decree? Yep, that's going to be my implication. Tomorrow, I'll come back. <laughs> Give you the reason why. I think that way. And, uh, and also, the timing it happens in, uh, obviously, the first year of Cyrus. And of course, that brings in Jeremiah 25 and 29 about the fact that uh, Israel, Judah, was going to be exiled for 70 years, beginning in 605 B.C. Jeremiah 25, not 586 B.C. with the destruction of the temple. 605, fourth year of Jehoiakim is uh, when the first exiles were, were taken, which uh, means right around 536 B.C. is uh, going to be a time uh, that's going to be very, very important. Five, 537, 536 B.C. on that 70 years of Jeremiah. But again... Chronicles speaks about the 70 years. Ezra does not. So it seems to me that Jeremiah is Jeremiah 51. Uh, significantly, the biblical author had a lot of previous prophetic material to be able to, to refer back to, and yet in the end there's only, you know, probably one passage from Jeremiah that he is referring to. But for those of us who know the canon... Obviously, Daniel 2, 39, um, the, uh, uh, the, the second uh, empire of the statue, again, the second beast, chapter 7, verse 5, Cyrus by name in 10, 1, and the Medes taking Babylon 5, 30, 31. We've already made reference to that in Daniel. I've already talked about Chronicles, Cyrus's decree. And then Cyrus coming before us again in Ezra and again, during uh, Cyrus's time period. And then uh, Cyrus is referred to in the past tense in uh, chapters 5 and 6 as the one who issues the decree that then Darius gives a further decree for the building of the, uh, the temple. Now Cyrus uh, was the, the conqueror. He basically uh, pushed the, uh, the, uh, the empire to, uh, to the, to the, from, from Persia to the to the to the west, not so much to the southwest. Uh, didn't uh, uh, go into Egypt. Actually, he died in where is uh, modern day Afghanistan, trying to push the border of the empire more to the northeast. He is followed Cyrus. by his son. This is Cyrus. Yeah, he's followed by his son Cambyses, who then pushes more to the southwest to Egypt. And uh, though he uh, invaded. And defeated the Egyptians. He wasn't able to, to stabilize the, uh, the Persian rule there. He's called back, uh, assassinated along the way. And so Darius I is not a physical heir from Cyrus. Uh, Darius seems to emerge out of the ruling council. And uh, some believe, therefore, that Darius was, uh, took this name because Darius was kind of the throne name. Um, might tie into possibly Cyrus being called Darius in, um, in uh, Daniel 5 and 6. Uh, that's a, 
<clears throat> that's an interpretive debate we won't get into here, and I'm not sure we can resolve it with the historical information we have at this point. But uh, Cambyses, and of course by, by invading Egypt, he would have to pass through or by Yehud. But uh, no record of his involvement uh, at all, obviously we'll find in Ezra chapter 4, it's a time when Israel was not at work at the temple anyway. The opponents in the land had the upper hand. It's only when we get to Darius. Darius has already been introduced to us in, in the book of the 12, Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, Haggai's uh, prophecies are in the second year of Darius. Zechariah begins and uh, prophesies in the second and then, what, the fourth year of uh, of uh, Darius chapter 7 and 8. So chapters 1 to 8 of Zechariah of, as well as Haggai, 10 chapters of the 12, emerged during the historical time period of Darius. So something of Darius is known already before we come to Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, as you hear us in Artaxerxes, canonically, our, uh, our, as you hear us is known, he is the, uh, the king who uh, had the queen Esther. Uh, the story of Esther, which takes place between the record of Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. I won't get into it because it really doesn't play a role in what is taking place in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, other than uh, the Jews throughout the Persian Empire, including Yehud, were not destroyed because of Haman's plot against them, as narrated in the book of Esther. And, uh, and then as you hear us, began his reign with a, a continuing anti-Jewish thrust, as well as Ahasuerus, as, as well as Artaxerxes, according to Ezra chapter 4, and then further into his reign, I believe, between the coming of Ezra and Nehemiah as well. But we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. So, so the Cyrus, Darius, Ahasuerus, who's known by his Greek title Xerxes, and Artaxerxes, and uh, these are the predominant kings. The Persian Empire reached its zenith under Darius I. Darius is the one still pushing to the west uh, for uh, 490 B.C. who engages the Greeks who push back. And then from 490, obviously, until you get to uh, Alexander the Great, in uh, 334 B.C., you've got a continual you know, battle taking place on the western frontier uh, between the Persians and the, uh, the Greeks. And so Persia reaches its apex of power under Darius. Darius was also the great administrator. Cyrus and Cambyses were warriors, were fighters, military men. Darius is the bureaucrat. <laughs> in fact, he probably shouldn't have tried to invade Greece because he really wasn't, a, you know, he really didn't have military strength. But he is the one who created the great uh, Persian road and, uh, you know, and uh, divided the, uh, the kingdom into his uh, 20 satrapies and uh, basically uh, uh, you know, broke the Persian Empire into administrative uh, units that uh, was then followed by the playboy king. As you hear us, if you want to know why I call him that, read the book of Esther. Uh, a man who was all about wine, women, and song, who also tried to invade Greece and also failed miserably as well. Uh, he, he wasn't the greatest military mind either. And uh, Artaxerxes uh, was not known for his military uh, prowess as well. And so it was just a matter of time until the Greeks got strong enough and had their military mind uh, you know, come uh, come about that was able to uh, to, uh, to defeat the uh, the Persian Empire, and of course that happened very quickly, from 334 to 330 BC. Three quick uh, battles, Alexander the Great was able to conquer and uh, destroy the Persian Empire. You mentioned Ahasuerus was entirely Jewish for Israel, and how does that connect with the story of Esther? Ha uh ha -huh. ha! How does that tie in? All we know is at the beginning of his reign, and we're going to see it tomorrow in Ezra chapter 4, uh, the anti 
Israel propaganda continued at the Persian court, court at the beginning of Ahasuerus. And do remember that he, he wed Esther not knowing she was Jewish. Later on, Mordecai becomes uh, his, uh, his uh, prime minister who was concerned for the welfare of the Jews, which would be also not only you know, in, uh, in Persia itself, in Susa Ekbatana, but probably also spread to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, the uh, uh, Yehud as well. So the threat is removed. But nevertheless, when Artaxerxes comes, the opponents renew their attack at the Persian court. And so in his early years, he's anti, giving some idea of, of how the Lord used Ezra and how Ezra got into the good graces of Artaxerxes is one of those things we do not know. Now, obviously, Nehemiah is very, very clear. We know how Nehemiah was able to get into the good graces of Artaxerxes because he was a cupbearer. He was one of the king's counselors. But when it comes to uh, uh, Esther, I mean, uh, to Ezra, how did, how did Ezra get the decree he got if Artaxerxes began being basically anti-Jewish? At, at least giving credence to what the opponents had to say about what about what Israel was doing. And basically their propaganda, as you're going to see in Ezra, was always the same. That if you go back into their history, these Jews in Jerusalem are not loyal, faithful subjects of the king. That was always their attack. And, um, and what they're doing in building the temple and ultimately then building the wall, this is all going to reverberate against the king. This is going to become an independent kingdom. And, of course, uh, the Persians uh, were very, very uh, uh, one, and particularly since you got in. And Xerxes, as you hear us, seems to be uh, um, assassinated as well, both by poisoning. So, of course, you want a cup there. <clears throat> you drink that wine before me. Can you drink it? And now for the next uh, 30 minutes to an hour, we're going we're gonna to talk about affairs of state. And I'm going to see whether by the hour from now you're still alive. I mean, the, the cupbearer was almost a bodyguard as well. Yeah, so, hey, I'm thinking of some of the good stuff later. But, uh, but this was all part of it. I think we, we think Darius died a natural death. But there, and, and there's also some uh, debate later. This is after, obviously, as we mind, it comes to an end, a narrative, of Artaxerxes the first, that died of the suspicious need. And you see 423, the debate whether he died in 424 or 423, because he wasn't replaced until 423. It seems like there was some intrigue after he died, which again, seems as though that uh, there was some, you know, palace um, shenanigans taking place uh, before, um, before he uh, is, uh, is, uh, is his replacement finally you know, takes, takes hold. So this, uh, you know, being being king of the Persians uh, didn't necessarily mean you were going to die a peaceful death. Right. Someone is always out to get you. And uh, by, by the way, everything. Just about everything we knew about the Persians until about 100 years ago came from the Greeks. And the Greeks referred to the, to the Persians as barbarians, barbaric, unrefined, undignified, brutal, scheming. And every, every, everything against you know, Greek rationalism. Well, we found out that they had their own propaganda machine and uh, they, they, they want to show themselves as superior to the Persians because ultimately they won. Alexander. They, they want to remember the victor always gets to tell the story. Right? And uh, yeah, Adrian, so. but okay. we're, we're having fun here today, aren't we? <laughs> uh, That banner is kind of like a Persian king. <laughs> <laughs> this microphone, you can't trust it. 
Okay, there we go, green. Is it what? Yeah, it should work now. Okay, we're, through, we're, we're now. You're back. Sorry about that. Thanks, Josh. Yep. Uh, problems. Oh, we're having all kinds of fun here today. This, this reminds me. <clears throat> we won't get into all the bloopers. You, you, the numbers you watch, the, the, you know, the stuff on your computer. It wasn't always pretty, you know, when uh, we were uh, taping. So... Um, that's, that's why New Testament now was uh, all done in, in studio. You know, we can <laughs> ameliorate these things. Oh, well, okay, that gives you a little bit of a background. And the, the evangelical expert on the Persian Empire is a man by the name of Edwin Yamahuchi. Also read, uh, wrote the uh, commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah in, uh, ex in the uh, Exposed Bible Commentary. But his book, Persia and the Bible, is well worth having, a uh, outstanding uh, reference work. Uh, and as I said, he tends to be expert in all things uh, Persian uh, among evangelical scholars. He's uh, emeritus, is retired now, but uh, a, good, a good scholar and uh, <clears throat> part of the, uh, the resurgence of uh, Persian information. I'm not going to get into this. Obviously, we get... Uh, uh, the text telling us about the first year of Cyrus, the second year of Darius, uh, the, uh, uh, the work on uh, the temple uh, be, being completed in uh, the, uh, the sixth year of Darius, 615. And what I've tried to do is reduce that along with the seventh and 20th year of Artaxerxes. I tried to... Uh, I tried to give you some idea of the, of the chronolog chronological thrust and uh, the movement as far as the book is concerned. Now, one of the things you note is that even though almost a hundred years worth of history is recorded in the book, a little over a hundred when you include uh, chapter 13, close to a century, you know, getting through uh, chapter 12. It's very uneven. There are high points. And, of course, there's a debate because it, uh, the text never tells us clearly when the Jews uh, returned after, after the decree of Cyrus. The decree was issued in the first year. That doesn't mean they went back in the first year of Cyrus. And so that's why you have, and uh, in that first chapter, uh, I give you some, uh, um, uh, some of the reasons why I have noted uh, the uh, text as I have as far as the dates is concerned within that chart. You'll notice everything is within a year or two. And uh, so we can be fairly precise on when the events take place. The where... You can take a look at a map in the back of your Bible, but basically uh, uh, the post-exilic Jews lived in a very confined area compared to the rest of Old Testament Israel, even the southern kingdom, that uh, really you can put Jerusalem in almost 40 miles, a circle around Jerusalem. That's about as far as the, uh, the province of Yehud, where the Jews were able to go back and resettle in what was uh, under the tribes, the, the very northern part of Judah and the southern part of Benjamin and the very southern part of, uh, of uh, Ephraim. That, that, that would be as much as you have as far as that, uh, that province is concerned. Very small and, uh, uh, and uh, poverty-stricken. Now, I give you an outline all at this point there is, there is agreement on the overall uh, blocks of material in the book. Ezra 1, 1 to 6.22, the first six chapters are a block we'll look at tomorrow. Begins with the decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple. Concludes with the rebuilding. Temple rebuilt and the dedication of the temple in the first Passover. 
held at the, uh, at, at the temple. Uh, beginning and ending, it's going to emphasize the, uh, uh, the sovereign work of, of God. That's a very clear literary unit. So we'll look at that as a block. Then we get to chapter 7 to 10, also a distinct literary block. Here we have what I refer to as the rebuilding of the people of God begun with the obedient actions of God's servant in response to the sovereign actions of God. That's Ezra. And uh, basically the events recorded here take place in about one year, one 12-month block of time. Uh, in the, uh, the seventh year of Artaxerxes going into his... Uh, into his eighth year. So that's a, a distinct block. Also, when we get to uh, uh, the book of uh, Nehemiah, now here's a little bit of debate, and we'll uh, look at it, uh, on whether to include chapter 7. And, and we have to realize this, as far as historical narratives, it's not only true about Ezra and Nehemiah, but also true of other books as well. You can have paragraphs that both conclude a previous block and introduce the next block. That's what we have with Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7, okay, the walls of Jerusalem are completed, the doors are hung, the city is ready to be repopulated. In other words, the purpose for which Nehemiah has returned is coming to an end, but who is to repopulate the city? All right, he finds the, uh, uh, he finds the, uh, the list of those who returned. Okay, these are true Israelites. Okay, and so from, from that list is going to come those who repopulate Jerusalem, which does not take place until chapter 11. The repopulation of Jerusalem doesn't historically take place until recorded in chapter 11. So is chapter 7 the conclusion of the building of the wall and the fortifying of the city, or is it, it, is it the introduction to the repopulation of Jerusalem? And my answer is yes. So is it the conclusion of the block that began in Nehemiah 1, or is it the introduction of the block that, that goes you know, into Nehemiah chapter 13? And my answer is yes. Where do you put it on your outline? Well, I guess to be right on, both places. Because it, it is a conclusion, but it is an introduction, that, that list in Nehemiah chapter 7. And if you don't believe me, wait till you start reading Nehemiah 11, and boy, name after name for a chapter and a half. You're going to feel like you're reading the Jerusalem telephone book. You know, and... Um, We'll talk about how to preach that when we get there on, uh, on Friday. And that's much harder than, uh, than even uh, uh, Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7 because there's a very clear indication of why the list is there. So you can kind of overview the list and why it's important and how it fits in. Obviously, also the, uh, the list of, of a chapter and a half, chapter 11 into halfway through chapter 12, are important too, but they play different roles and uh, that's what you're going to have to emphasize, of course, as far as your exposition is concerned. So here I just bring, I, I take it through chapter 6 and then begin another block of material. And then we have a debate. Many would take what begins in chapter 7 and or chapter 8, depending on what they do with chapter 7, going all the way through the end of chapter 13. But in my mind... I see a very distinct unit, small unit, compared to what we've had previously in chapter 13. And I would be beginning at verse 4 to 31. Of course, I'm going to have to get to the end to give you my substantiation. Basically, at the beginning, what you want to do is, is you want to get a feel. All right? You're not the first person to read Ezra and Nehemiah. You're not going to be the last. All right? For those who've read it previously, all right, what are the blocks of material? Again, going back to Dr. MacArthur, what he would do is very early on, you know, read, as he's reading through a book, he'll read through the whole book, but he can't, particularly like an Isaiah or Jeremiah, 
as you can keep reading through all these chapters, you want to start to get, okay, where are the, you know, where are the, where are the, uh, the literary blocks beginning and ending and start to get your major, you know, divisions and then start concentrating. And so you can read Ezra 1 to 6 as a unit. You can read 7 to 10 as a unit. You can read, as I said, uh, Nehemiah 1 to 6 or 1 to 7 as a unit, 7 to 13 or or 8 to 13 as a block of material that has unity. Although, as I said, I think when you get to chapter 13, uh, there, is a, there is a stink thud, uh, particularly in light of how positive uh, chapters uh, 8 through 12 are. Chapters 8 to 12 of Nehemiah, are, are the most, some of the most glorious chapters of the Old Testament. You, you, think, you think you have reached the millennium as you read those chapters. This is what the millennium is going to be like. And then thud, you're brought back to reality. All right, I'm looking carefully at the time here. All right, so that gives you a little bit of my apologetic for how we're going to look at the book. Why 1 to 6 tomorrow? Why originally we going to be 7 to 10, but now I'm going to get it into uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. So we'll bridge a little bit on Wednesday and then, you know, get through chapter 8 on Thursday and get to that highlight and thud on Friday. So you know what's coming. It's going to, it's going to build and you're going to say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so... I've already told you, the church is going to end on, I mean the church, the, 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 the course is going to end on a downer. The church will end on a downer too. That's a little bit of an application, but we'll get there later. Now, I like what Goswell does. In fact, I added this uh, over the weekend, uh, just before I posted uh, this, and that is the characters of Ezra and Nehemiah. This is something that... Um, I think it's valuable to do, and it's, it's good to introduce this to you uh, before you get as Bereans into your actual, you know, passage-by-passage passage, uh, evaluation. I, I reread, as I said yesterday afternoon, Ezra and Nehemiah, and with this in mind, I was particularly looking for how God was referred to throughout the book. And it was fascinating. I, I basically based what I put in the notes, just on Ezra chapter 1. There's, there's, a, there's enough substantiation there to start to, to see how God is characterized. And like I said, this is my problem with Goswell. Goswell, in his character in Ezra and Nehemiah, leaves out the most important character, God. Yahweh, Israel's God, who is referred to, obviously, as God. And even by... Uh, and, and, very interesting, in all the Aramaic portions I noticed yesterday, Yahweh is never used. It's always God. And then significantly, even in the Hebrew portions, there's times when even Ezra and Nehemiah, the Israelites were referred to Yahweh as simply God, Elohim, or El. Right away, and this... Uh, is uh, seen throughout Ezra, the God of heaven. And obviously uh, and into the Nehemiah portion as well. Who is for Israel, the God of Israel, that is my God, our God, your God, is God, their God, depending upon what the context is. All right, so Yahweh, the God, the God of heaven, is the God of Israel. In the Ezra portion, but throughout, my God, our God. Uh, and you can see that just at the very beginning of uh, the book, 1-3 um, uh, in, in the Cyrus's decree, whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. So there's the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Right? Because in their, their mind, okay, God is identified with Jerusalem. Now, there's a sense with the temple, that is true. 
Deuteronomy chapter 12. This is the place God has chosen his name to dwell. And so the temple, now, there's going to be no indication the, you know, the, the cloud comes over the mercy seat in the most holy place in the second temple. But nevertheless, this is the place that God has chosen for his name to dwell. And so because of that, it becomes an important place. He is, and so you just realize why a pagan deity, would, a pagan uh, uh, king would say he is the God who is in Jerusalem. That's where his temple is. That's where his, that's where his name is known. That's where his presence uh, historically was. He's the God associated with Jerusalem, as all, uh, in contradiction to the gods who are associated with other temples, other places. Uh, it, is, it is significant in Cyrus's decree that he is, he is truly speaking of Yahweh, but in a way we'll see tomorrow that doesn't overwhelm necessarily his pagan roots. He can say certain things about Yahweh, and uh, that is the reason why, of course, the God of heaven, i.e., the God in heaven who overrules everything that takes place upon the earth. And uh, that is the way particularly in which Israel will speak about their God to the pagan kings. And, of course, obviously at that point, uh, Cyrus is uh, saying in verse 2, he is the God of heaven. He's the one who's appointed me. He controls all things upon the earth. But he's a particular God located in Jerusalem. Is Israel's God. Not necessarily my, my God. He's their God, your God, his God who dwells in Jerusalem. So you can, you can see how he's a politician. That's a good way to put it. All right. He, he, knows, how to, he knows how to keep evangelical support. But I'm not making any political statements. All right. The people of God, which and I would agree with Goswell, if you're talking about human characters, they are the main character of the book after the Lord. They're the ones at the very beginning uh, where, uh, again, within the decree, whoever there is among you of all his people. And, of course, when you get to, uh, to Nehemiah chapter 13, you're going to see the people fail. Right? So people are introduced at the beginning, people at the end. Uh, the Persian kings, uh, all the way to chapter uh, 13. Uh, Nehemiah goes back to serve Artaxerxes and then returns for a second governorship. And then the leaders of Israel... Significantly, throughout the book, the heads of the father's households, the elders, the priests, and the Levites. Now, they're not the same heads, obviously, generation by generation, but it's interesting. The heads are involved. They're, the heads lead the people to return all the way to their leading the people in making, you know, the covenant and, and being responsive. They're, sorry to say, leaders in Israel's sinful behavior of Ezra 9, Nehemiah 13. Same thing with the priests and the Levites. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the sins again of the people infect the religious leadership. Priests are those who offer sacrifices. The Levites are the, their helpers. And priests and Levites had a particular role of teaching God's word, God's Torah. And that role is going to become more and more vital as the book goes on. In fact, by the time you get to the end of, of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, the priests and the Levites, um, their role as teachers and communicators of God's truth in Israel predominates over their sacrificial duties, their cultic duties. And then we have the famous Shezbaz, we'll talk about him tomorrow, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Ezra, Nehemiah, specific leaders that, uh, that are mentioned as well, and the peoples of the lands. Now, getting back to, uh, to what uh, Goswell said, he talks about what he calls flat characters. That is, throughout the book, they really don't change. 
the way they're introduced is the way they come across throughout the book. Well, Yahweh is certainly that way. He's the sovereign God from beginning to end. Can't understand the book without understanding the sovereignty of Yahweh. He's in control of all that is taking place. Um, the good hand of God was upon me. The good hand of God uh, you know, led me. The Persian kings. Let me say just a little bit about the Persian kings. The Persian kings are flat characters too. Every Persian king, and this is where my implication is going to come also with Cyrus, are always responding to information they are receiving. They are, in one sense, tyrants, but they are tyrants who can be persuaded. Cyrus is persuaded, chapter 4. To, uh, to stop the building. Darius is persuaded to reestablish. Artaxerxes is negative and then positive, then negative, then positive. So throughout the book, okay, the Persian kings, all right, whoever is influenced at the time, that's the one they're listening to. By the way, that same characterization is also in the book of Esther. I guess I can make a reference to Esther. Same thing about, you know, Ahasuerus, Xerxes, in the book of Esther. Whoever's got the last word in, that's who's influenced. And so you got these strong, dictatorial, tyrannical, you know, men, strongest men upon the earth, and yet they are open to the, the, the latest you know, information, and they're easily persuadable. How easy, we'll talk about uh, on uh, Wednesday with Nehemiah. But again, remember, he is the cupbearer, and, and he, gets, he gets Artaxerxes to change his mind. So that's what we got. We got these strong men that are very, very persuadable. Uh, that make a decision they can't seem to follow through that commitment. They're politicians. We've got to use our terminology today. I wouldn't trust a politician as far as I could throw them. Because a politician is, tell me which way the wind is blowing and I'm going to get in front of it. All right? Even our own leaders are influenced by Others that that they're not don't tend to be politicians. Don't tend to be people who have an inner core of commitment. They just they just blow with the wind. Persian kings, leaders of Israel. Now, when we get to Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Ezra, Nehemiah uniformly seen in the text as virtuous, godly men. In fact, I probably godly first. Particularly Ezra and Nehemiah are men of prayer, men of scripture. And even Zerubbabel and Jeshua are, are men who hear the prophetic word of Haggai and Zechariah and follow through. They're good men. Sheshbaz is not enough said, although enough is that obviously he was loyal to do what the king had uh, called him to do as the, uh, the prince of uh, the Jews. Now, with the heads of the father's households, the elders, the priests, the Levites, now, now they are more like the people they lead. Now, as opposed to being flat characters, that is, it really don't have any change of their basic characteristics. God's will is right. The people of God, you never know from one chapter to another where they're going to be. And this, this develops throughout the book. Are they or aren't they really loyal to Yahweh? Are they or aren't they committed 
to him and to his will. And will crescendo to positive toward the end of Nehemiah, and yet the greatest thud is at the end of Nehemiah. It's like this... It's like this roller coaster just picks up speed and intensity as you go through the book. And at the point you think, wow, they are godly, how ungodly they are. They're the characters who change. And... uh, And Goswell is right, to a certain extent, that then becomes the plot of the book. Where are the people today? Where are the people in this chapter? Are they good or evil? Are they loyal or disloyal? Faithful or unfaithful? Obedient or disobedient? And compared to other places in the Old Testament, as I said, by the end, they... The, the, the all good to all evil almost becomes predominant. So that with Nehemiah's word, you're almost, can I put it this way, to the Elijah syndrome? Only I am left? Remember me, O oh God, for good? I'm the only one who's still serving you? Now, like Elijah... I believe there was still more godly in Israel, but it's true, there were fewer godly than ungodly, though just a couple of chapters before, it seems like they're all godly. And so that is the movement of the book. Where are the people? And in the end, the people of Israel are right where they have been now, and the peoples of the lands, okay, they're universally against the Jews. When use that. Now, we'll see tomorrow in chapter 6, there were, like Ruth, there, there were pagans who did convert to the worship of Yahweh that were embraced by Israel. But that gives, gives uh, a argument against those who believe Ezra and Nehemiah as rigidly anti, <clears throat> you know, anti-ethnic Jew. That's not true. Uh, what comes across, obviously, is the peoples of the land are anti-Yahweh, anti-Israel, anti-Israel's God, anti-Israel people. They're uniformly against, mocking, scorning, opposing what is taking place. And uh, so God uh, obviously deals with them, but deals with them through his, uh, his work in Israel. And then finally, I have to say a word about finding Christ in Ezra and Nehemiah. It is universally agreed there is no direct messianic reference in Ezra Nehemiah. There is no prophecy concerning Christ. And you'd be hard pressed to try to press any character into a type of Christ. Now, Goswell, and I I will just read it uh, to you. Uh, I basically agree with him except for this uh, statement that, uh, that he makes, page 41. He speaks about the fact that, and I'm not going to get into a whole debate, discussion today about Christocentric preaching, but he does bring up that we are New Testament expositors dealing with an Old Testament book. We are New Testament expositors speaking to Christians this side of the cross from what is in an Old Testament book. 
So he says, and I would agree, the Christian reader has no option but to seek to relate the contents of Ezra and Nehemiah to the climax of God's saving purposes in the personal work of Jesus Christ as portrayed in the New Testament. Now, as you go through Ezra and Nehemiah, and, and uh, some of you might want to uh, read Hamilton or, uh, Times, his uh, Exalting Christ in Ezra and Nehemiah, and you, you usually find that he's got plenty of ammunition to do this. There's plenty of places in Ezra and Nehemiah where the sin of Israel comes front and center. Now, once you start thinking in terms of, of disloyalty to the Lord, unfaithfulness to the Lord, disobedience to the Lord, can you at that point, as a Christian expositor, say, and we now know the answer to the sinful propensity of sin, uh, of sinful people, is not moral reformation, because that's proved, that proves through Ezra and Nehemiah not to, not to work. We now know the ultimate, the ultimate way is a change of heart, which comes through the finished work of Christ, accepted by faith, reception of the Holy Spirit, etc. Can you do that? Yeah, I have no problem with doing that homiletically. That's legitimate as a, as a Christian expositor, you know, to say, all right, the answer is not in Ezra and Nehemiah, but we know what the answer is now. That's, that's okay. You know, the, Ezra and Nehemiah gives the problem, and New Testament gives the answer. Right? And, and someone said, well, that's Christo, Christocentric preaching. Well, that's what your definition is. Right? Um, Goldsworthy calls gospel-centered. And I would think gospel-centered is better than Christocentric at that point. Yeah, you can, you, gospel-centered preaching, that's fine. You can get the gospel in. That's where Steinman with his... With his with his Lutheran background, everything in the Bible is either law or grace. So he gives you some help on where is the gospel in Ezra and Nehemiah? Well, whenever there's sin and, you know, God dealing with sin, all right, there's grace. All right, so he's got, I gave him the pages there if you want to look it up. And so he, uh, and sometimes you find Lutheran expositors or exegetes can kind of help you here because they're looking for grace, even in the Old Testament. Problem is, they're looking too much for law in the New Testament. But uh, we won't go there. This is um, theology is in another class. So I have no problem. Yeah, okay. We want to relate. Uh, and even the Old Testament points to Christ. It's Christotelic as a whole. So he says, and he, this does not mean, however, that we will necessarily find specific prediction of Jesus Christ in Ezra and Nehemiah. That's very true. We won't. But the onus is on the Christian interpreter to relate the contents of this book in some way to the Savior. As much as I love Dr. Goswell, I take issue with that. It is not up to the Christian interpreter to inject Jesus into Old Testament interpretation. The onus is on the Christian interpreter. No, it's not. Now, if you want to say the onus is on the Christian homiletician, I have no problem with that. Here's my basic problem with Christocentric preaching. Right there in that statement by Goswell. People in the pew have a hard time knowing when we're making a sermonic jump and not a hermeneutical move. Remember Fee's statement, the text can never mean what it never meant. If Christ was not there originally, you by interpretation can't put him there. And Goswell says, he's not there. But it's up to the interpreter to find him. How can I find what isn't there? Can I relate what's in Ezra and Nehemiah to the Christian? And the answer is yes. Not as types, but is there a sense in which 
Zerubbabel, Joshua, like based upon actually Haggai and Zechariah, you could say that canonically antecedent scriptures already prepared you for looking at Joshua and Zerubbabel as possible types of the Messiah because of Haggai chapter 2 and Zechariah 4 and Zechariah 6. And I would have no problem with that. But be sure that you relate to the fact that that's in the prophets, not in Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah is not making them types at all. But having seen a priest and having seen a, a governor, a leader, be viewed as, as you know, types of Christ, are there analogies between their behavior in Christ? And the answer is yes. Zerubbabel leads the people. He is the, the leader of, of the people, the, the recognized leader coming from Babylon to, uh, to uh, the land. Can you say by analogy he is like Christ leading his people from captivity to, to freedom? Yeah, I have no problem with that. Homiletically. If you make sure people understand that's not the interpretation the interpreter, the, the author intended from that passage in Ezra 1 and 2. And as a preacher, this is where it gets very, very difficult. Because I, I listen to my messages too and evaluate them and say, oh, if I was a person in the pew, sure sounds like I got Christ into that passage interpretively and not homiletically. I didn't talk about as a New Testament believer, we can, we can see an analogy between you know, what that person does in Christ without saying that that was the author's intention. That's just what I'm bringing up basically as a practical application for or implication in my discussion this morning. Implication of the text. Because in Ezra and Nehemiah, who is the hero? God. And God, we now know, is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Is there a sense in which Christ is the hero, Ezra and Nehemiah? And the answer is, as God, yes. So the sense of which, any time I see, God led the people. God blessed the people. God was with his people. Okay, I can bring a legitimate, I can bring a legitimate implication to say, this reminds us of how our God in the person of Jesus Christ, now that's, a, again, a homiletical statement, not an interpretive statement. I think sometimes it's very difficult in the Old Testament to say we're talking about the Father, Son, or Spirit. I know Dr. Lawson did it yesterday morning in Romans. The Father's the planner, and uh, the Son is the, the one who, who, uh, uh, who puts into, into uh, practice the plan through the, the enablement and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And I agree, Romans 8, you can get Trinitarian, you know, from 18 to 39, it's all there. You know, the Trinity is there. I have no problem in the New Testament. It's kind of harder to make that kind of dicing of the triunity in the Old Testament. And again, I have no problem in passages, you know, like Isaiah 44, 45, obviously where you have, you know, the Redeemer of Israel who sends his Redeemer, you know, endowed with the Spirit. I mean, all right, this passage like, but what about Ezra and Nehemiah? How, how do you say... As you begin, as we will tomorrow, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven. Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? Answer? Yes. Doesn't the triune God reign from heaven over earth? Yes. Has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. 
Well, I can say it's God's plan and, you know, the Spirit's enablement for Cyrus to become, yeah, a redeemer, a shepherd, a messianic anointed one, uh, according to Isaiah, but that's, that's, not, that's not here. He's appointed me to build him a house. And yes, I can get to chapter 6 and what Cyrus decreed, God brought to pass. For a New Testament believer, whatever God has decreed to take place in your life, he will sovereignly bring it to pass. I can make that homiletical statement based upon what is in the Old Testament. But is that the interpretation of the Old Testament, to find Christ in that way? And the answer is, that <laughs> I think the author of Ezra Nehemiah says, I'm not looking for Christ. I'm just telling you what God did, what Yahweh, the God of Israel, did. Now, certainly, because he's now with the Lord, I understand now the further progress of what God has done, and I can see how you can make a legitimate implication about how this teaches you something about Christ and put that into a sermon. But don't change the meaning of the text to make it mean something it never meant. I have no problem. I have friends who are Christocentric preachers. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may you do a lot of preaching from the New Testament. <laughs> but avoid James. Um, but be careful when preaching the Old Testament. But two my non-Christocentric friends, and I have plenty of those as well, and I count myself probably among them. Let's be careful that we never relate anything in the Old Testament to Christ. And, uh, and even when it's not direct or we have New Testament basis to, to the logically. It's a, it's a fine line. And to a certain extent, you've got to know the text, you've got to know your audience, I am not one who believes that every message, every Sunday, has to end up with an evangelistic appeal. Um, that's why Christians are around non-Christians uh, in a church service. When it's all over, they can say, glad to have you with us today. What would you think? What would you think about what you just heard? There's uh, plenty of ways evangelism can take place without every sermon becoming evangelistic. Which, whether we like it or not, can become a danger of Christocentric preaching. Every message ends the same way. You're a sinner. Christ is the Savior. Trust Him. It's interesting that some of those people who end up there as my Christological friends, you know, a generation ago were, were attacking the Southern Baptists because every Sunday morning message was evangelistic. So be careful. By the way, my exposition is going to have to begin tomorrow morning because we're out of time. But that's not bad. A good reminder of what we did today, first uh, 20 minutes or so, and uh, then we'll get into Ezra 1 to 6. So, you know, where am I? I, I, I want to be very, very careful that in my interpretation of the Old Testament, I don't jump to Christ interpretively because I want him to be homiletically in my sermon. And I have to be very, very careful when I preach the Old Testament where Christ is not clearly the subject of the passage. That if I do invoke Christ against the total context of canon, as I do with sinners need a savior, need a deliverer. Just, there was a physical deliverer, like a crisis, the spiritual deliverer, etc. I got to do that in such a way that the audience knows this 
is a theological implication based upon the totality of the canon and not the interpretation of this particular passage. And gentlemen, I'm, I'm here as someone almost entering my 73rd year preaching after 50 years and I still don't feel, I always get it precise and right. I have to almost say, God knows my heart, <laughs> and, uh, and yet I sometimes get attacked because I'm going to err. I'm going to err on the interpretive side, making sure I don't overstep the bounds of interpretation because I want to make sure that my hearers don't take what for me is a homiletical move and make it as their interpretive model to interpret the Old Testament, and particularly Old Testament narrative. And somehow in the last 25, 30 years, God has led me to, to be more involved in, in the exposition of narrative, both Old Testament and New Testament, than didactic material. Maybe because I was a history major, I love history, uh, my wife read novels left and right. I'm not a novel reader because uh, I don't like fiction. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, I, I, I like a good story. I like to unravel a good story like Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and, and so it's where probably 80% of my preaching has been done. And being at the seminary for 25 years, when men invited me, they always wanted me to do narrative. The reason is because they probably weren't doing it themselves very much. So why don't you come to a Bible conference and do a narrative on, on some narrative I haven't done. And uh, you try to wend you know, your way <laughs> precisely and clearly and uh, try to make sure people know what's interpretation and what is theological implication for a New Testament believer. And I'm saying that's... That at times is a fine line, and uh, I am, uh, can I put it this way? Maybe 10 years ago, I was a little bit more um, harsh on my Christocentric brothers. I'm not quite as harsh now. I mean, I understand you're preaching to a New Testament congregation. Um, it's not easy. And you don't want to go month after month, week after week, going through Ezra and Nehemiah and no application is ever made to a Christian audience. It's just a history lesson. I, I, Ezra and Nehemiah is history, but it's not just a history lesson. Ezra and Nehemiah is history with a theology lesson. And we have to make that clear. And a theology lesson for a Christian at times is going to have to invoke the name of Christ, but it has, has to be done carefully. Now, basically all I've done is say, be careful, do it well, do it right, and I'll pray that you do, if you'll pray, I do as well. And uh, I'll leave it at that and we'll, I'll do some expositions. And uh, significantly, I did a paper ETS a number of years ago on on uh, the Bible speaks that because one is a Christocentric priest, isn't same thing with a Thomas um, in the, the Reform Expository Commentary. Uh, Thomas will give as many practical applications for Christian living as he does pointing to Christ. In fact, uh, many of his messages don't necessarily point in the end to Christ. Uh, and yes, this is, this is a avowedly Christocentric homiletic commentary supposedly so I'm saying you know when it comes to the week in week out exposition you're going to find out basically that I think the Spirit's going to lead you to do it right if your heart is in the right place if your mind is in the right place and if you'll make sure not to read Christ back in to where he isn't but let it flow out homiletically based upon the New Testament on what the Bible says about God and how thou thou relates to us as Christians through the personal work of Christ. So there you go.
I know I haven't cleared all up for you. Maybe some of my expositions will do that. But, um, <clears throat> but that's where we are. And uh, again, I would err on the side of caution rather than finding Christ in every verse of Ezra Nehemiah. All right, our time is gone. And uh, you've been a joy. And uh, tomorrow, with all that background, we actually dig in to the text. So, yeah, bring your Bible tomorrow. If you didn't have it today, bring it tomorrow because we'll start with verse 1 1 and uh, go through uh, the end of chapter 6, verse uh, 22, and uh, try to bring out some of the salient uh, points that are there in the, uh, the text. If you haven't done your reading this afternoon, if you've got about an hour and a half or this evening, do your first reading of Ezra Nehemiah. You'll find tomorrow will make a whole more sense if you do. Okay. Lord bless you. Have a great rest of the day.